Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for the invitation to be here with you this afternoon. So the debate continues, single row versus double row. So what I want to do is lay out some of the groundworks about what we're thinking about, uh, put together some data for you, looking at the literature, and then tell you a little bit about how I approach this in my practice. So uh, 1994, Dr. Gerber and Haber and Mr. Gold were our first presenters. The first form of one that we established was what's here called book length sensation in Boston. We want our prepared construct to have a high sensation strength provide minimal gap formation, a high load to failure, and ultimately we want our repair construct to be stable with how bone condition occurs. So since Dr. Gerber's uh, study, how have we been doing? Well, overall we have about a 26% failure rate. This has improved somewhat over the past 20 years, but still is not that great. Unfortunately, our mean post-operative shoulder score is still just about 85% of maximum, not significantly improved over the past 20 years. We found that our patient-reported outcome measures improved even if the repair didn't heal, and that re-tears were more frequent in larger tears, patients with fatty infiltration on the rotator cuff muscles, in older patients, and in those patients that received a double row repair. So optimal fixation, where are we in 2023? Well, I will submit to you that the gold standard today is an arthroscopic procedure performed using suture anchors. But how does the literature guide us regarding how many anchors should we use how, or where should we place these anchors? Suture configuration. What type of suture configuration should we use and how many sutures should we place? So that's what we're going to talk about today. The literature can be very confusing because there are multiple different techniques that are uh, described within the literature. These broadly are grouped into either single row or double row repairs based largely on how many anchors are utilized and where they are placed into the greater tuberosity. We all know that not all single row repairs are the same. We have simple suture configurations. We have horizontal mattress configurations. We also have more complicated suture uh, techniques, such as the modified Mason Allen, the ripstop suture, and also the massive cup stitch. We also know that not all double row repairs are the same. We have non-linking double rows. We have a knotted transosseous equivalent and a knotted transosseous equivalent. So when we're approached with these patients in our practice, how can we utilize the literature to guide us in the decision-making process so that we can achieve all of those goals that Dr. Gerber provided us back in 1994 to give our patients the best chance to obtain a solid tendon to bone uh, healing. When we look at the literature regarding footprint restoration, it's pretty clear that the double row transosseous equivalent is superior to the single row repair. Biomechanically, the double row is uh, uh, superior, showing greater loads to failure, greater cycles to failure, less gap formation, and overall, greater rotational stability when, repaired, when compared to single row constructs. So in these data, this is, shows that the double row is better. But we need to keep in mind that these are earlier studies. These were largely comparing a horizontal mattress single row to a transosseous equivalent double row. And this is an important fact and we'll come back to in a minute. So how do these patients do clinically? Well, this is a meta-analysis published in 2013 looking at double row versus single row repairs. They found that the double row repair provided significantly higher rate of intact tendon healing, but really no difference in clinical outcomes. These authors suggested that the double row technique should only be used in carefully selected patients. So this is a systematic review of overlapping meta-analyses. This is published by the Rush Group in Chicago, and they looked at clinical outcomes and structural healing. When they looked at clinical outcomes, they had six of the meta-analyses showed no difference between the single row and double row repairs, whereas two of the meta-analyses showed that the double row was superior for those larger tears greater than three centimeters in the anterior to posterior dimension. With regards to structural healing, two meta-analyses showed no difference, three meta-analyses showed the double row to be uh, superior for those larger tears, and two of the meta-analyses actually showed that the double row was superior for all tears. When this group backed out the data from the three most high quality meta-analyses, they found that all of these studies showed better structural healing with a double row repair. So when we digest this data, this would suggest that clinical outcomes probably don't have a difference between single row and double row repairs, but that the double row repair does favor uh, structural healing in this uh, data set. So why aren't we do doing double rows for everybody? Well, maybe some of us are, but there are drawbacks to the double row repair. It does take more time, it is more expensive, it's also more technically demanding, and there is that potential for failure at the bottom of the disjunction, the so-called Stop. 
suffered in pain. So is there a different or better road to Or a contemporary type of single row repair. Uh, how does this compare to a not? Is that better? Okay. Uh, Hello? Okay. Uh, so this is a cadaveric study looking at uh, suture bridge double row versus a triple loaded single row repair. In this study, they showed that the triple-loaded single row had superior biomechanical properties when compared to the transosseous equivalent double row repair. So when we compare this to the earlier study we discussed, so this would suggest that maybe a triple-loaded single row repair is superior to a double row repair, which is superior to a horizontal mattress. This is just the biomechanical data. How does this play out clinically? Well, this is a study from the group in Southern California looking at 91 shoulders uh, the mean tear size is 2.6 centimeters, so these are mod uh, moderate sized tears. Minimum two year follow up, 91% of their patients were completely satisfied, and 92% of the patients had an intact repair on post operative MRI with median of 32 months follow up. But how do these patients uh, with a single row, uh, triple loaded anchor repairs compare to a double row transosseous equivalent? Well, Bob Tajan and his group at the University of Utah looked at 47 patients retrospectively with medium sized rotator cuff tears. They compared a double row suture bridge technique to the triple loaded single row technique. They found similar improvements in both pain and function and equivalent healing rates. So in this patient population, no difference in clinical outcome or healing rates. Alan Barber took it a little step further and he provided a randomized controlled trial looking at triple loaded single row repairs versus a double row suture bridge configuration. He did add in platelet rich plasma fibrin membranes in both groups in this study. So these are 40 large tears. These are greater than three centimeters in size. So remember, these are the patients that were shown to really benefit from a double row repair uh, in the previous studies. So looked at 20 patients in each group with an MRI to assess uh, uh, retear rate at 12 months. He found that both groups, both single row and double row repairs, had a similar retear rate of 15% on MRI at a minimum 12 months, but no statistical significant difference in patient reported outcome measures. So his conclusions were that uh, there was no difference between triple loaded single row repairs and double row repairs, either in clinical outcomes or structural healing. Now we know based on the work done by Ken Yamaguchi that these asymptomatic re-tears in the early post-operative period, uh, they can become symptomatic over time. This typically occurs on an average 2.8 years after the surgery. So this study looks at 80 patients with three year follow-up, transosseous double row versus a single row repair. They found that the double row was superior for those larger tears, but no major difference between the two groups with the smaller tears. Now, how about more follow-up? This is 22 patients at 12 years. Single row using a modified Mason-Allen technique versus a double row suture bridge technique. Clinically, again, no difference between the two groups, but the re-tear rate uh, was better in the double row uh, repair group and both the short-term and long-term follow-up. Now, interestingly, when we break out the constant score for these groups, we look at single row versus double row, no difference in pain, ADL, um, range of motion, or strength. But we look at the intact tendon versus the retear, no difference between pain, ADLs, and range of motion, but there is a difference in strength. And this is often what we see in our patients with these uh, retears uh, uh, post op from a rotator cuff repair. So, a larger study, 77 patients, mean follow up of 10 years. Work score, although statistically significantly improved in the double row uh, repair group, uh, the authors suggested that although statistically significant, this may not be clinically relevant because the absolute score is 79 versus 72 um, on the scoring metric. Uh, ASES constant and strength, no difference between the two groups. They did find more of a decline in the patient reported outcome measures in the single row repair group at two to 10 years versus the double row. And although the retear rate uh, favored the double row in the early studies, the retear rate at 10 years follow-up was better in the single row group. So how do we summarize these clinical results? Well, overall, when we digest this clinical outcome, small to medium tears, double row equals single row, really no difference there. Larger tears, there may be an advantage for the double row, but this is still really debatable within the literature. We really don't see any difference in the larger tears, double row versus a triple loaded single row repair. Regarding structural healing, small to medium tears, there may be a slight favor to the double row, again, debatable within the literature. 
large tears, double row, I think is better than the uh, single row repair. Uh, but when we compare the double row and these larger tears to a triple row to single row uh, technique, uh, there really haven't uh, been any differences. The main thing we're missing in the literature here is long-term follow-up, uh, the triple loaded single row versus the double row repair. So hopefully these are data that we'll be able to look at in the future. So now that we're armed with all this information, what are we going to do with it? Well, my approach, I think anybody approaching rotator cuff repair surgery should have uh, ideally two or three different types of techniques that they utilize on a regular basis and feel comfortable doing based on their patient's need and the type of tear that they are approaching. In my practice, this is a single row horizontal mattress, a triple loaded simple suture, a more contemporary uh, single row in my mind, and a double row transosseous equivalent. So for my patients with small to medium sized tears, these are less than three centimeters, there's minimal retraction. I find these are typically, you know, our crescentric type tears and that anterior cable is still intact. In my mind, biomechanically, when that cable is still intact, there's less uh, biomechanical force on my repair. And I think this is a great option for repairing these patients because what you need to do more than anything is reapproximate the tendon back to the greater tuberosity. For me, these patients need to have good tissue quality because I want to ensure that the, uh, the suture uh, tendon interface is very robust. In those patients with large massive tears, these are greater than three centimeters. These often involve the anterior cable and sometimes extend into the upper border of the subscapularis. And these types of tears or in those tears that have limited mobility and I may be challenged to get the, the rotator cuff reestablished to the greater tuberosity. For these patients, I will use a single row, triple loaded, simple stitch, particularly if there's suboptimal tissue quality. In my mind, I'm medializing the repair, I'm placing the anchors on the uh, medial aspect of the greater tuberosity, and then I'm taking as much tendon as I can in my simple stitches, and by doing that, you're not over tensioning your repair. For those patients with large tears, again, these are greater than three centimeters, anterior cable is often disrupted but I have good tissue quality to work with, and it's very reducible. These typically be, tend to be your more acute type of tears or in our younger patients. For these patients, I feel that a double row transosseous equivalent repair uh, can be very advantageous, and I think uh, would, the literature would support this for both clinical outcomes as well as structural healing. So my post-operative protocol for my small to medium-sized tears, sling immobilization for six weeks, uh, PT begins for passive range of motion and active range of motion at two weeks, active range of motion at six weeks, light rotator cuff strengthening at 10 to 12 weeks, and expected return to full activity at six months. For my large to massive tears, these are the greater than three centimeters in the anterior posterior dimension, I slow these patients down significantly. I place them in a sling for six weeks and I don't allow them to move at all during that time. No home exercise program, no PT, strict sling immobilization. They start physical therapy and a home exercise program at six weeks, doing passive range of motion, active range of motion at that time. They can begin very light rotator cuff strengthening at 12 weeks, and I tell them and their therapist to go very slow with this rehab. I'd rather have a healed rotator cuff and a stiff shoulder than vice versa. Their expected return to full activity is nine months because we go very slow with these patients. So in conclusion, both single row and double row repairs can provide improved clinical results. But we need to remember that when we, uh, when we examine the literature, not all single row repairs are the same, and not all double row repairs are the same. For small tears, I think it's dealer's choice. Single row and double row, either way, you're going to do great. But I'll submit to you that the single row may be better in this case. It's quicker, it's less expensive, and it provides less postoperative pain. For largeable, reducible tears, double row is superior to the single row repair, both clinically and in structural outcome. And these patients consider doing a double row transosseous equivalent repair. If you're faced with a patient who has overall poor tissue quality, or maybe you're in difficulty reducing the rotator cuff back to the greater tuberosity, this is time to really consider medializing your repair, placing your anchors along the medial aspect of the greater tuberosity, and doing a single row repair using triple loaded suture anchors in a simple stitch configuration. Thank you very much for your attention.